On this episode of Great American Gardens, we visit a luxurious garden where no expense was spared when it was created. The extravagant Namur Estate in Delaware. Ancient trees like the ginkgo and dawn redwood spread their sheltering branches over the campus of Smith College in Massachusetts. And a touch of France lives on in a sprawling estate in Louisiana. It's all coming up on our tour of Great American Gardens. Welcome to Great American Gardens. I'm Tricia Springer. Although the legendary DuPont family made a fortune in America, the DuPont heirs did not forget their French roots. In 1909, Alfred I. DuPont created a lavish series of formal French gardens on his estate in Wilmington, Delaware. He named the elegant estate for the town in France where his great-great-grandfather once lived. This procession of gardens, fountains, and sculptures seems like a parade for a king. Rather, it's an American estate built by one of the DuPont industry tycoons in Wilmington, Delaware. At Namur, Alfred I. DuPont created an ode to his French ancestry, reminiscent of the era of Louis XIV. It's pretty spectacular when you look at it. I mean, it's, it's not something you would see in a normal garden by any stretch of the imagination. This Wilmington, Delaware estate is often described as a miniature Versailles. Some of the marble statuary comes from the palaces of European nobility. Love is immortalized in bronze. And never-ending hedges create a feeling of infinity. This estate is a pageant featuring more than a hundred acres of gardens and dozens of fountains. The main gardens march away from the mansion in synchronized procession for a third of a mile. This breathtaker was 26 years in the making, beginning with the mansion in 1909 and finishing with the Temple of Love in 1935. DuPont's respect for his French roots is evident throughout the estate, named Namur after the town of his ancestors. It's a basic French style with the parterres, the long columns of trees, the border gardens. We have quite an extensive uh, collection of statuary, fountains and basins, which are typical in all, all French gardens. Some say Alfred I. DuPont was inspired by love. He decided that he wanted to create something for his second wife, Alicia. The gardens and mansion here were designed for her, with her help, and this was a gift for her from him. It ultimately became a gift to everyone when Namur opened to the public in 1977. The grand tour begins with the Begonia Line Drive leading to the estate. Just beyond the gates, on the steps of the mansion, sit a pair of marble sphinxes commissioned by King Louis XIV. They're called portrait sphinxes, and their faces are sculpted to resemble one of the king's mistresses. From the steps, eyes are magnetically drawn down the vista to the reflecting pool. 157 water jets dance in a circle at the center of this one acre pool. During DuPont's day, visitors swam here, but the only company left from those days are the lounging figures of the Four Seasons. Their sculptor took some liberties with Greek mythology. The two seasons, summer and spring, are supposed to be female in Greek mythology and the seasons of fall and winter are to be male. He opted to make summer male and fall female. The same artist created the bronze statue of a man and woman which dominates the maize garden. 
The sculpture is called Achievement, but its underlying theme is love. The idea behind it was a woman encouraging a man and inspiring a man. The statue was DuPont's idea, sparked by the inspiration that he discovered in marriage. A winding maze surrounds the couple on the pedestal and sometimes confuses couples in the garden. The puzzle is outlined in hedges of Canadian hemlock and Hellerai holly, just part of the more than five miles of hedges at Namur. In the maze garden, the hedges outline a fiery duet of golden wizard coleus and red salvia. Beyond the maze is an imposing colonnade, which features two pairs of red marble vases from the palace of Emperor Franz Joseph of Austro-Hungary. Behind the colonnade is another marble creation, designed in part by DuPont's own son, architect Alfred Victor DuPont. Namur's opulence reaches a crescendo at this garden, hidden out of sight from the main parade of masterpieces. In the sunken garden, steps of travertine marble lead into a watery playground of white Carrera marble, filled with sculptures of children. The Italian marble is crafted into an Italian motif, featuring Roman-style grottos reminiscent of ancient Roman baths. This hidden garden is just one of an astonishing array of surprises at Namur. American creativity has combined with European design and royal works of art to turn these gardens into a classic masterpiece. It's one man's achievement, encouraged by his family and inspired by his ancestors. When we return, a tree that supposedly helps people improve their memory thrives where students crack the books. We'll see the stately ginkgo tree at Smith College in Massachusetts next on Great American Gardens. Back to Great American Gardens. It's not unusual to see ivy growing on the walls of America's colleges and universities, but ivy is more than a decorative feature at Smith College in Massachusetts. A gift of ivy is a rite of passage. The students who attend college at this liberal arts school in Northampton are given an English ivy plant when they arrive as freshmen, a reminder that they are not only in an institution of higher learning, but that they are in the middle of a public botanic garden. Nestled in New England's scenic Pioneer Valley in Northampton, Massachusetts, the campus of Smith College is an academic setting rich in beauty with its lofty trees and picturesque pond. But there's something different about these grounds. This small private women's college is a place where the campus itself is a garden, a beautiful living laboratory enjoyed by students and visitors alike. The selection of the site for the campus was based on its beauty. We have uh, rolling hills and elevated areas, bodies of water, waterfalls. The Botanic Garden of Smith College is an arboretum, a garden, and a campus, home to a tree once believed extinct. The oldest rock garden in North America. And a secret complex of garden rooms. The students who stroll this 125-acre campus enjoy a beautiful garden with over 8,000 different plant species. The primary purpose of this garden is to collect and document plants from around the world. In the 1880s, student enrollments were growing at Smith College, and the school needed to expand. They hired America's preeminent landscape architect, Frederick Law Olmsted in 1892 to create a new landscape for the campus. Olmsted designed winding drives, walkways with open spaces, 
and he envisioned tall trees that would endure for decades. One of the more unusual trees is the Dawn Redwood. In the early 1900s, this tree was believed extinct, but in 1941, a Dawn Redwood was discovered in China. By 1947, Smith Botanical Garden was germinating seeds from that tree, and as a result, a beautiful Dawn Redwood stands today. One of the more interesting trees found on the Smith College campus is the ginkgo. One of the oldest tree species, the ginkgo flourished when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. It can live to be 500 years old. Behind me you see a ginkgo tree. Ginkgos have been on earth for over 200 million years. This one was planted in the late 1800s and as you know ginkgo is now used as an herb. It's supposed to improve your memory. Another rare tree that thrives at Smith College is the Ben Franklin tree, or Franklinia. It is believed to be extinct in the wild. A Franklinias are not that common in this part of New England because of the cold hardiness issues. We've been able to find a microclimate where it, it basically does okay. The microclimate that nurtures the Ben Franklin tree is the sheltered slope of the rock garden. Installed in 1898, it's the oldest rock garden in North America. The rock garden includes 2,000 types of alpine, dwarf, and woodland plants, some of which are rare or endangered. The dry, rocky terrain simulates a mountain environment. More than a garden or an arboretum, the Smith College campus is a place of learning. One of its best teaching tools is the systematics garden. These are beds of plants arranged by a botanical relationship, which allows students to examine and compare different plant species. This is a very important garden for the teaching function, where the biology students who are taking courses like evolution and taxonomy can actually look at the floral morphology of plants within each family and see the relationship those plants have with each other. While the garden is pretty, its main function is to show the characteristics of each specific plant family. The systematics garden is over a hundred years old, but Smith College has gardens created in the 20th century, too. Cape and Garden is designed as a series of secret garden rooms around the college president's house. Visitors enter it through a 65-foot rose arbor lined with perennial beds of blue delphinium and yellow coreopsis. Cape and Gardens is one of the more charming small gardens on campus. There's a rustic rose arbor that's made from uh, posts of local black locust trees with climbing roses on it. There's a gazebo area with beautiful formal designs of bedding plants which are rotated every year. The Botanic Garden of Smith College has flourished for over a century. Here, students and visitors alike can study, learn, and simply admire. When Great American Gardens continues, an avenue of 200-year-old live oak trees escorts visitors into an elegant Louisiana estate. When we return, we'll take a stroll back in time. I'm Tricia Springer. In Louisiana, what was once the exclusive estate of one of the South's richest cotton farmers is now a place open to the public. The original owners were inspired to build Rosedown Gardens after their honeymoon in Europe and with Versailles fresh in their minds. Drifting through an aisle of elderly oaks, the Louisiana mist seems to whisper the words from a diary written more than 150 years ago. My gardens are in perfect order, Martha Turnbull wrote of her historic gardens at Rosedown in 1848. There is a history about the Rosedown, primarily because of Martha Turnbull. In other words, to think that she kept a daily diary from 1836 to 1896. Nearly every day she recorded what she did in that garden. Today, Many of Rosedown's trees and shrubs are either originals or descendants of those planted in the 1800s, making this historic collection one of the most important in the nation. At 
throws down, heirloom trees drip with Spanish moss and memories. Hydrangeas change colors and recreate the garden's grand old days. And formal parterres are a reminder of a honeymoon long ago. This 371-acre state historic site in St. Francisville, Louisiana, was once a prosperous cotton farm. And the 28 acres of gardens around the mansion were once the province of the Lady of Rosedown, Martha Turnbull. Daniel and Martha Turnbull were once among the wealthiest people in the South. In the 1830s, they built a house and began planting gardens on their estate, named Rosedown after a play they saw during their honeymoon in Europe. On that honeymoon, they toured the great gardens of France and Italy, where Martha gathered ideas. At Rosedown, Martha's gardens blended French formality with naturalistic English landscape design. One, you have the kind of the romantic movement. In other words, the very casual naturalness of the path system that it meanders through the woodland. And then you have areas of the garden that are very architectonic. In other words, the, the, the geometry is very, very beautiful. Today, a Greek revival style gate opens onto an avenue of southern live oaks that are nearly 200 years old. Along a 660-foot lane, the elderly trees lean toward each other as if to share old stories, while curtains of Spanish moss slowly reveal the antebellum home beyond. I have photographs of Rosedown, just probably over a hundred slides of just the avenue. And there's not one slide that is the same, because what is the ever-changing effect that you never have exactly alike from the day before, and that's light. Long ago, Martha Turnbull's roses nodded their pretty little heads between the great oaks. And then one day she realized that the canopy of the, the um, live oaks was so great, I have to abandon the roses here and go to a rose garden. Today, gardeners plant many of the same kind of antique roses Martha would have grown, just to the south of the main house in the formal rose garden. In summertime, the gardens are swathed in the soothing pastels of blue and pink hydrangeas, another old-time flower that Martha loved. In her day, these flowers from the Orient were more rare, but today their changing colors continue to be a source of wonder. Both colors come from the same flower. It blossoms a pretty pink, unless the soil has a high acid content, which causes them to turn lavender blue. The more formal side of Rosedown's personality is revealed in the parterres. These gardens of patterned borders are achieved today with hedges of yopon, a type of local holly. The borders are a reminder of that long ago honeymoon where Martha and Daniel once walked among the parterres of Europe's formal gardens. Even though the gardens are laced with such formal designs, they can also have the warm intimacy of a private diary in the very quiet, serene spaces where there's a summer house. And you can just imagine yourself going there in the context of a huge garden and just taking a book and reading it and feeling very comfortable. At Rosedown, old-fashioned flowers make the pages of an old diary come alive. While giant living heirlooms line pathways to the past. It's a place of formal history and informal romance, where 150 years later, the gardens are once again in perfect order. Gates which once graced the entrances of palaces now decorate a lavish estate in Delaware. We'll see these ornate gates when we revisit the beautiful gardens of Namur, when Great American Gardens comes back. Wiggle. Wiggle while you're wiggling freedom. Welcome back to Great American Gardens. As we saw earlier, Alfred I. DuPont spared no expense in creating the majestic gardens at Namur. It's an estate fit for a queen. In fact, the main gates once actually belonged to royalty. 
They were built in 1488 for Wimbledon Manor, an estate owned by England's royal family. In 1543, King Henry VIII presented Wimbledon as a gift to his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, and Wimbledon became a popular retreat for the royal family. On the other side of the mansion, we have the Russian gates, and, and they were on the palace of uh, Catherine the Great outside St. Petersburg. Alfred I. DuPont bought the Russian gates at an auction in the 1930s, a humble fate for the trappings of a fallen Russian empire. Thank you for joining us on our tour of Great American Gardens, and remember, public gardens are your gardens.